This is a public announcement service brought to you by Mel. This video is not spoiler free. Thank you for tuning into this broadcast. Look at it. You guys, it's here and it's so freaking pretty. Look at it. It's time for a 24 hour readathon me thing. I cannot even begin to explain to you guys. I was so terrified that this book would not make its way to me on time and it's here. It's in my hand and it's actually a lot prettier in person than I was expecting it to be. I was not really a fan of the cover when I initially saw it but in person though it's kind of hot. It's kind of sexy. I know it's a weird introduction. It's a weird way to segue into the video but welcome everybody if you're new. My name is Mel and welcome back if you're already part of the fam. As you can tell by the title of the video today's subject matter is all House of Sky and Breath by Sarah Janet Mass. Miss Janet is here with a new release. I am super excited. I did my reread of Crescent City, also known as House of Earth and Blood, in January, so I'm fully ready. I've got my theories. I've got all of it cooking, and I am super excited to dive into this one. Just as a warning, though, this book will contain massive spoilers for the book. If you guys do not know my format for my anticipated releases of vlogs, what I do is that I have the intro of the video, also known as this, followed by a theories section, which will most likely definitely contain spoilers for the first book in the series, followed by the bulk of the reading vlog, which will be spoiler filled. I already know myself and I already know that this video is going to be hella long, so let me not waste your time. Let's get right into my theories. <clears throat> I've got a pad folio here in a very <laughs> professional manner with all of my theories. Theories to Mel is present and voting. Hello. And I've got not one, not two, but three pages of theories. So let us run through these right now. I also feel like some of these might not happen in this book, but later on in the series, but I just wanted to write all of these down. I sat down last night with both of my copies of Crescent City, which are annotated to filth. I also pulled out my copy of A Court of Silver Flames. I even watched my last Crescent City reading vlog, and I also watched my A Court of Silver Flames vlog just to see what else I caught onto that I could include in my list of theories. And I have to say, I think I have a few good ones for this video. My first question, and it's a question more than a theory, is how many secrets was Danica hiding? Because we saw a lot of secrets in book one, a lot of things that Bryce had no idea about, things that not even people surrounding Bryce had any idea about that Danica was involved in, and I am very curious to know what else Danica was hiding from Bryce. Although they are really, really good friends in the series, and we saw it, through love, all is possible, I really do feel like Danica had her fair share of things to hide from Bryce, all with good reason, because we all know that Bryce is a really big player into whatever is going to happen next. And I'm very scared to see what else Danica has kept on the down low from her. My other theory, which I feel is so obvious given that it's a Sarah J Maas book, but I definitely think that Bryce and Hunt are going to be mates. I think in the past, and this is referenced in page 70 of Crescent City, we see this one specific moment where Hunt tells Bryce to calm down and she immediately listens and she immediately calms down, which if you know Bryce, it's very unlikely that she does that. And to me, that felt like a mate's command, though I don't know what route this book will take if they'll be chosen mates or faded mates. I'm not quite sure yet, but it's been seen several times in Crescent City. Not only does she follow Hunt's commands when she says something and vice versa, but they also have a keen awareness of when the other is in the room and it is very specifically only with each other. There's also a big thing with mates in Sarah J Maas books where their scent is very peculiar and obviously very different from other people's and they also tend to scent each other a lot when they're in the same room. So I feel like we're gonna get a good twist in this one or a good explanation at least to justify how how these two are made. Another big question that I have for this particular book, and I do hope that we get some answers, is who is Hunt's father? We saw in Crescent City that Ada said that he knew Hunt's father. We also saw a moment that I write down the page number. I don't think I did, but we got this moment where he sees Hunt for the first time, Ada's in particular, and he says, you possess the power of, but we never really saw the answer or the rest of the sentence. So we don't really know whose power Hunt possesses, but we do know that he's the only person in the whole of Pangera in the whole of Valvara that actually possess the power of lightning. I am also very curious as to what Adas is scheming. He has been behind the scenes this whole time, but we see at the very end of the book that he is playing an active role in whatever war is developing in Crescent City. And he said that things are about to get very interesting. And I wonder if things getting very interesting involve actually crossing over worlds because we know that the Massverse is all connected in some way, shape or form. And we also get some 
some semblance of an idea that all of these series are happening around the same time, pretty much. And so I wonder if that's what he means in particular. And he also put a lot of emphasis on the Great Library of Parthos. What exactly is in that library that Ada's treasure so much or that he's trying to treasure so much so as to people not burning it down and losing that knowledge? What is in there that Ada's believes could be a game changer for this war? He also specifically told Bryce, come find me when you make the drop and let's finish this whole thing. Finish what? What needs to be finished? Was Ada's in alliance with Prince Peleus and Queen Thea in the first war? That's one of my biggest questions because he seems to be very familiar with the power that Thea had in the first war and he sees that light shine again in Bryce. I almost wonder in a way if the library contains the truth of the first war and the truth of the origin of the Fae and the angels in Balbara in Crescent City because that is also something that we know absolutely nothing of. I am also very curious to see, and I don't know if we're going to see it in this book, what exactly the Oracle's prophecy meant regarding Rune. The Oracle said that the royal bloodline would end with Rune. I personally don't think that means he's going to die because that would also mean that Bryce had to die in order for the royal bloodline to die. But I do believe in some sort of way that we might not see royalty at the end of the Crescent City series. And maybe there will be a whole new hierarchy in place at the end of it all or no hierarchy at all. Maybe we won't even see the Fae in this world any longer because my next theory is that this and the world of A Court of Thorns and Roses are intrinsically connected. I think the main of my theories is that why have artifacts that allow people to travel through universes and time been introduced both in A Court of Silver Flames and in Crescent City? We've got the harp in A Court of Thorns and Roses and we also have the horn in Crescent City. And I do believe that at some point, Bryce will use the horn to travel to the Accord of Thorns and Roses world to Valaris, maybe? And I did see this teaser that Sarah Damas put up about Bryce's power not being ready. And I'm wondering almost if recent Cass and Ass could potentially train Bryce with her power. Because I don't know a lot of people who could train her in Crescent City. So what happens if we harness the power of the horn and travel to Valaris and see what happens there in relation to these two potentially being connected? Connected. We don't really know where the fate came from in Crescent City. What happens if they actually come from Prithian, if they come from the world of Akotar? We also see a very mysterious character in Crescent City that we really don't know a lot of, which is Fury, which is one of Bryce's friends. And Fury is of unknown age, unknown origin, and unknown everything, really. The only thing that we know is that she is an assassin for hire. She works with the rebels, and a lot of people within Crescent City actually fear her. And what is so special about Fury? a plain and common assassin that could potentially scare away these people. Maybe her and Amran, who is also of unknown age and unknown origin, the same species, or maybe they could know each other. Another thing to solidify the fact that these two are connected is the fact that we haven't seen a lot of people possess ability of controlling shadows and manipulating them in a way that benefits them personally. The only two people that we've seen have this ability is Asriel in A Court of Thorns and Roses and Ruin in Crescent City. There's also a a reference that when I was watching my Accord of Silver Flames vlog, I completely forgot about this moment. And then when I was flipping through the book, I also noticed that when in Akosov, much like Ada's in Crescent City, mentions that there is the possibility of traveling through time and space and going through different universes, there have been so many mentions of this that I just know one way or another, these two worlds are going to be connected. And not only that, the Starborn sword that Rune has, we actually don't know the origin of. However, there is a passage in A Court of Silver Flames that talks about the Dread Trove, which is exactly where Nesta pulled her items from. If you know, you kind of know. But legend says a prince, general, and a queen who stole a sword and the sword was never seen again. What happens if that sword is the Star Sword in Crescent City? Not only that, but also there is a knife on the cover of House of Sky and Breath and the sword actually has a sister knife that has never been seen. And you know who possesses a knife that this person allows nobody to touch and use? Asriel in Akotar, and it's called Truth Teller. What happens if the twin blade to the Star Sword is Truth Teller? Very curious thing to note too, that on page 535, there is mention of Bryce's mom being a vessel for Sathana, that is the goddess that reigns religion in Crescent City, and that her stepfather, Randall, is actually the vessel for Solace. So two gods, and I wonder what that means for Bryce and if it has any 
sort of validity to it because it was said by essentially like a religious cult. So I wonder if it actually, again, has any sort of weight into the story. Is she God blessed? Is she a God spawn? What exactly does that mean for Bryce? Because we've seen instances of other God blessed in Sarah J Maas books before. And I think those are my theories for now. I also just realized that I am eight minutes late for my live show with my patrons. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go start this. And I hope that you guys enjoy the rest of the video. Sit back, grab your snacks, grab your drinks, and I hope that you're ready again to have a good time and beware of spoilers because we're about to get into them. Okay, prologue. Was not expecting the book to start out like that. I don't know how I was expecting it to start, but I was not expecting it to start with a completely new character. We've got Sophie, who's a Thunderbird, and the Thunderbirds have the ability to manipulate energy and electricity in whatever way they want. At first, I was hella shook because I was like, is this another person who possesses Hunt's powers? Like, is can this person manipulate lightning? But no, it's kind of different, but similar? No, definitely different, Mel. But I was not expecting us to get a POV solely of the human rebellion and given the establishment of that I am going to go ahead and guess that we're probably gonna get alternating chapters between the human rebellion and then everything happening in Crescent City which is super super interesting because that's the one side of things that we didn't really get to see in book one and apparently Miss Sophie has information that can once and for all make them win the war against the Asteri but now she's supposedly dead which I do not believe because because we did not see a body. We just saw her submerged in water. I definitely see the shift right now. I definitely see us getting a completely different story and narrative than we got in book one, which if we know Miss Mouse, she tends to do that a lot. Y'all, not this man offering Bryce to count out his abs. I'm here for it. Let's count them all out, Bryce, for the sake of my sanity. This is how you know they're mates. Listen to this. The air behind Bryce went electric, buzzing and alive. The hair on her arms prickled. A male voice sounded from the vestibule. A benefit to having wings. No one wants to sit behind you. Bryce had developed a keen awareness of Hunt's presence, like scenting lighting on the wind. He had only to enter a room and she'd know if he was there by that surge of power in her body. Like her magic, her very blood answered to his. My only question is, why are their powers so reciprocal of each other? What exactly is connecting them? Like, that's what I'm wondering. There seems to be so much more to it. Excuse me, what? I have a lot of questions. So I am on page 61 and uh, I need to know why Bryce is betrothed to a man that we've never met before. Like this dude just walks in, he flames up his hand thinking he's all that. And then he goes, King Anar, which by the way, what a name. But also I'm here to meet my bride. Bitch, who the fuck are you? Nobody know you, not even in your own house do they know you. But thanks for attending the party and trying. I am very shocked and I'm just really hoping, elevating the prayer, that he's like, yes, betrothed to her, but like he's not really interested and he's got his own little side booty happening so that we don't mess with the flow of Bryce and Hunt. Not that Bryce would even let that happen because I don't think it's like even feasible. And now we found out that Bryce works at the Fae Archives where they investigate like ancient artifacts that aren't necessarily known. We don't really know where they came from from and they just have a lot of interesting information that needs to be profiled through the archives. I wonder if she's gonna find some semblance of answers on there. Also, when they were at the Crescent City Ballet, there were a bunch of statues and actually one that very clearly resembles Thor. It was somebody holding up a hammer, which obviously sounds like Mjolnir, and it was striking down lightning and Bryce jokingly said like, haha, this looks like you. Is he the son of a god? M maybe. And also, why are they so dumb? Because not only is now Bryce betrothed to Cormac, also 
they decided to wait till winter winter solstice for what to get to know each other better look i will praise miss mass for actually having some pacing to a romance but we all know what we want that does not include waiting see i constantly go back and forth with bryson hunt and i'm like do i love them do i hate them they had this really cute moment and i was also i wrote this down in my theories i'm still wondering what the scar or the mark that has appeared on bryce's breast or like on her chest what it means it's like a star with like a bunch of points is that just like a brand for the starborn fae so that they can build their own little you know like their army so they can kind of sniff each other out like is that what that is it's like a brand for the starborn fae is it something else we now know that it lights up by itself she can't really control when to start when to stop hunt actually covered it with his hand and he's like i got you like it's fine i'm, I'm here for you i'm always here for you and that was hella cute two other things before i go back to read twilight why do we have a twilight reference in this book chapter three <clears throat> rune danon knew three things with absolute certainty I just need to understand why this is a creative choice. But also, Cormac, they can control shadows. What does this mean moving forward? I am interested in knowing. I guess I'll find out eventually. Okay, hunt, hunt with the book questions. Bye, woo. Hello friends, it is currently 1.52 a.m. This is how we're doing and we're still reading. I, again, it's just the feminine urge to ignore all my responsibilities and read this book this weekend. So I'm currently on page 143 and I have loads of things to go over. So let's go. It's funny because I've got notes everywhere. I've got notes on my phone. I've got notes in the book. I've got notes everywhere. So let's just quickly run over some things that I have yet to talk about that have happened in this book. Much like what I thought this book would be, this book is taking its own completely different route and I absolutely love it. And I know this has been a point of contention for a lot of people with Miss Mass books. A lot of people are like, why is book one its own thing? And then the rest of the series, its own completely different thing. I personally really like it because I think that while yes, book one is a lot of exploration into Bryce's character and her own healing journey and the plot that very clearly surrounds her. I like the fact that in book two, we kind of realize that there is so much more going on to this war and so much more outside of Bryce too that is happening. That while yes, she's a player in the game, there are so many other variables and so many other moving parts that we aren't even aware of yet that we're gonna find out in this book and in the next few ones. I'm just excited to see how it's all going to connect. The first thing that kind of broke my heart was Ethan being kicked out by Emily and Sabine, which we already know these two are absolutely horrid. I absolutely hate them. In fact, in my reread, it's funny because I have it right here, but in my reread of Crescent City, I had a whole ass color for Sabine and Emily being absolutely terrible. They had their own assigned color and in very typical fashion, they beat up Ethan, they kicked him out of the pack and he is now a lone wolf of sorts. I love that his relationship with Bryce is slowly but surely improving and now they can talk which is something that they could never really do in Crescent City and that they're both on this path to healing and I think since they both shared so many memories together both just the two of them and them with Connor and then them with Danica I really do think that they're going to be really helpful to each other in that healing path and with that when they had their conversation about Connor actually thought you were his mate like he was convinced of that and it was also really interesting in the way that she described it that mating is different depending on your species but it only further breaks my heart to know that Connor wholeheartedly believed that because he was so adamant on the idea of dating Bryce. And I know I mentioned this probably, I'm pretty sure, in my Crescent City vlog, but honestly, it was just so heartbreaking to see him want this relationship to work out so much and him being constantly turned down by Bryce always continues to break my heart that they never even got the chance to try because I really do feel they could have worked out. It was also really fucking 
fucking shocking to find out that the hind is Hypaxia's Hypaxia. That X is throwing me off, y'all. This is not good for my Latina brain. They're sisters. That's just wild. Family drama will definitely ensue in this book. Also, we been knew that the Autumn King is absolutely horrible, but seeing him firsthand demean Rune in such a way where he says, She's got even more power than my son. And even then, being a wife is all that she can provide. The fact that they're literally seeing Bryce as a vessel, just as a breeding thing, is absolutely disgusting. And it only attests to the toxic masculinity of all of these fae, which again, they're all alpha holes. Hello. Disgusting. He is literally, and I love that this is my comparison to everything now. He is literally the equivalent to Abuela Madrigal, projecting those generational traumas, projecting his trauma of not having enough power and not being enough unto his son and his daughter. And it's not only that, but also making everybody around him feel inadequate just because he needs to feel like he's the most powerful person in the room. Literally, fuck off. I am also very intrigued to know because supposedly Bryce and Cormac have been destined in some way and there's a prophecy by the Avalon Oracle. I was destined to unite with a princess who possessed a star in her heart. That her mingling would bring great prosperity to our people. I have many questions on that. It was also a game changer, y'all. An absolute game changer. The fact that Sandriel's Triari are now going to be a part of this book and that they are joining the 33rd under... What's her name? Oh, I already forgot her name. <laughs> Celestina. Is that her name? Celestina. I'm pretty sure it's Celestina. Under her rule, that is only going to be trouble for Hunt and everybody else. I do not claim that energy. <laughs> like that shoes gonna be too much later on but also the curious thing here is that the hellhound actually was glad that somebody killed micah so i wonder if the really really bad guy here is going to be pollux which we already know is a piece of absolute garbage the hellhound seems to be just a little bit more friendly but i don't know if it's genuine and that's the part that scares me because i'm like i don't want to i don't want to give him the benefit of the doubt to then be a fucking betrayed like everybody else and last but not least the last update that i have is the fact that danica was actually corresponding with sophie so danica was in direct connection to the human rebellion in pangera and i wonder which again i mentioned in my theories and questions section how much does danica know and how much did she she actually keep from Bryce because it definitely seems like she was so much more of an active participant than anybody could have even understood at the time that Crescent City, the first book, is taking place. And so I definitely think that there's so much more that we're gonna find. I wouldn't even be surprised if she was leading a double life where she was like, you know, having like a whole thing over there and then a whole thing over here. There are so many possibilities with it. You know what? I'm gonna just go back to read Ziz Beauty. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, so apparently Danica was a bloodhound, which means that she could send secrets on people in like people's bloodlines. And she found something out about Fury that nobody else knows. And Fury said, I knew something dangerous about her and she knew something dangerous about me. Does that mean that Fury could potentially come from the Avatar world? Like I predicted? Y'all, what in the world? My question also is like why wouldn't she tell Bryce about any of this like that's my other question Adas is here I'm gonna cry Why? What do you know? Adas, Adas, what do you know? How do you know this? Adas? Other gifts? Wait, wait, wait a minute other gifts Adas, you can't just come in here and tell me all that and expect me to do nothing why is he saying that so condescendingly y'all if i'm right at the end of this all i don't know what i'm gonna do but i'm gonna be the most obnoxious person ever see this is always my question why is Adas so angry at the idea of pelias oh my god what Y'all, the blade is intended for the female heir, not for the male one. Oh my god. Pelias stole the blade from Thea? Pelias killed Thea? Oh my god. Escándalo. 
Oh, so Ada's wanted to help Thea. Was Ada's in love with Thea? That's my question. Oh my god. Who wrote the history, the Asteri? You've heard the truth in some form. I knew it. I knew it. Y'all, I was right. Oh my god, the library does possess the truth of Thea in the first war. <laughs> I'm ready for this book. I am not ready for this book. Ada's literally just asked them, what was the world before the Asteri? Where did the Asteri come from? Where did the Fae or the Shifters? He is asking all the fucking right questions. <laughs> said hell's armies shall strike at your command bryce quinlan oh and the mirroring he literally said it's your choice in the end it had it has always been your choice do you remember who says that mr resand <laughs> what y'all i cannot what cormac is agent silverbow the guy who's in love with sophie okay you guys so it's 4 a.m. and I do not pretend to stay awake for much longer. I have seven minutes left of a sprint. I'm gonna update you guys and then I'm gonna go to bed and wake up and continue reading. In regards to Donica and Sophie working together, there is definitely something that Donica knew or suspected that led her to work with Sophie and seek out the information that she was seeking out. We also found out that Donica was a history major, but when she found something out about the Asteri, she completely went silent in regards to the research that she was conducting for a paper. And I genuinely wonder what exactly is that she found. It has also been said by Cormac that Danica had her own agenda. And I wonder what that agenda was too. I hope that we get that answer. There seems to be this operation going on as part of Danica's plan that's called Dusk's Truth and Project Thur. The theory behind this that was said in page 195 is the Light Falls Quadrant so Lightfall, also known as Dusk, and then Thur, Thunder God. And they're assuming that this means the Thunderbirds and also the squadron for Lightfall that is under Pippa's rule, I think is her name, Pippa, pretty sure. Yeah, Pippa's Lightfall squadron. But what happens if it's actually talking about Bryce and Hunt? Because Lightfall, Light, Starlight, Starborn, it all falls under the same realm. Thunder, Lightning, Hunt. Maybe it's not necessarily referring to what they think it's referring to. And this passage also struck me as interesting where Hunt is talking about how powerful the Asteri are and how literally he's seen them do the absolute craziest shit that nobody can really stand up against. And this is why I wholeheartedly believe that they're gonna need the inner circle from Aquatar in order to actually defeat the Asteri because there aren't a lot of people that possess the ability to actually fight the Asteri. We're also getting a bit more of a romance between Mr. Bryce, Mr. Bryce, Mr. Hunt, and Ms. Bryce. In fact, there was a smut scene and Ethan's commentary in the background being like, can y'all shut up when Hunt literally goes, I will fuck you senseless. And he's like, that's not very medically safe. It was hilarious. Also, Bryce found a compartment under the coffee table and what she found was Danica speculating that maybe the Asteri don't even have powers. All we have as proof of their so-called sacred power is their word. Who has ever seen such a star manifest itself? If they are stars from the heavens, then they are fallen stars. And I have so many questions about what is gonna happen with the Asteri? They mentioned Agent Daybright, and if the plot twist with Cormac is anything to be led by, could Celestina maybe be Agent Daybright? Maybe a little bit too obvious, but could potentially be a little something there as well? Right, okay, so Hunt had a conversation with the Prince of the Pit. He said, why do you not use the gifts in your blood to free yourself? You don't know the fraction of what you might do, you and the Starborn girl. You are conduits, both of you. You have no idea how valuable you and the others like you are. So many questions and not enough answers. So I hope that I start getting answers soon. I'm excited and terrified at the same time. Love you guys and I shall see you tomorrow morning.
Christmas mask, you're not slick. Kate's 267. You think the gods have something to do with all this? And Bryce responds, after this spring, I can't help but wonder if there is something out there guiding all this. If there's some game of foot that's, I don't know, bigger than anything we can grasp. Hell is another world, another planet. Ada says so months ago. The demons worship different gods than we do. But what happens when the worlds overlap? When demons come here, do their gods come with them? We all came from elsewhere. We were immigrants into Midgard, but what became of our home worlds, our home gods? Do they still pay attention to us? Remember us? I love that line. I think that just solidifies the fact that this is going to connect with Akadar. Huh? The Ripper just, what? He just yeeted Rune into a fucking sewer. Also, for anybody wondering how this read is going, this is, this is how we're doing. <laughs> He knows, wait, Rune knows Daybright's scent and voice? And they just established a connection out of nowhere? Are they mates? Is this gonna be Rune's mates? Your scent. I can, I know it. You guys, what is happening? Oh my God. This interaction right here. Why do I know your voice? I can assure you, you don't. And you're about to be dead if you don't wake up. Your scent, you can't smell me. I can, I know it. <laughs> This. The prince of the pit wants to fight Bryce. He wants to have a showdown with her. The prince of the pit wants a worthy opponent this time. One who will not break so easily as Prince Peleus did not so long ago. He insists on facing you, Starborn, at your full power. Bryce and the sword? She just got a reaper. What is, what is happening? I have a Hills. With shaking fingers, she put it back into its sheath, dimmed its light, but the star sword still sang, and Bryce had no idea what to make of it. Of the blade that had slain that which was unkillable. Dude! I just finished part one. What just happened? That chapter reminded me so much of the battle scenes in Aquatar when Reese, Cass, and Ask, and all teleport and actually kind of just move people around and save people that's exactly the vibe that that gave me and i just think this book continues to solidify my theory that they come from prithian and i don't know what to do with all of this information bryce literally used the sword to kill a reaper and we literally saw the display of the sword responding to her more than it ever has to ruin and then also just bryce questioning whether they come from another world why is there such a reinforcement of that if the worlds are not gonna be connected. This is the other thing like apparently Celestina is like one of the good ones and I also have a feeling that Baxian is also one of the good ones I just don't know to what extent but Celestina literally tried to buy Hunt off Micah because she was friends with Sh 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 no, Shahar. <laughs> I was gonna say Shandriel and I also really love the development that we're getting with Ruin and Bryce I really love how their dynamic is shifting and evolving in a way that she feels very protective of Ruin obviously but also she is trying to include him in everything she possibly can but it's just really beautiful to have seen her actually invite him over to visit her parents and to kind of tag along and you know you can come over in winter solstice and just have a good time with us that was really really beautiful there's also something really interesting about Bryce's dynamic with her mom in this particular book I think in the first one we I mean we know that Ember is a person that is very meddlesome like she always wants to be in the know she always has an opinion she will always voice it and she's a very forceful personality as a whole. I wonder how her relationship with Bryce will keep evolving because there's definitely some element of boundary setting that needs to happen, but Bryce is not doing that. And you can tell that she is always evading her mom because of that reason, but it's also not a healthy coping mechanism. I don't know. I'm really, I'm liking this. And I feel like this is more like a bunch of reactions put together rather than any commentary, but it's just really fascinating to see everything unfold. I don't I don't even know how this is all going to pan out and I'm terrified. Hunt has won me over. Every semblance of doubt I had about this man is out the window. He listens to audiobooks while he works out. The love of my life. I'm gone. I've got updates. <laughs> Something that further proves that this might all be connected. Runes by their own solar system in the center of it all. Seven planets around a massive star. Seven Asteri. Technically six now to rule Midgard. Seven princes of hell to challenge them. Seven gates in this city through which hell had tried to invade this spring. Seven and seven and seven and seven. Always that holy number. 
cover, always. What else has seven things on it? Prithian has seven high fey cords. Could you imagine it doesn't connect at all and this is just like me going crazy for the entirety of a single reading vlog? It could very well be possible. Everybody seems to know more about Danica than Bryce ever did. It honestly breaks my heart to know that Bryce, who mourned her friends that much, and Bryce, who has always put Danica first, Bryce, who has always been there caring for Danica, even in death, preserving her memory, making sure that people knew who she truly was despite every rumor, despite every setup, despite everything. Like, Bryce has always been there for Danica, and Danica has kept so much from Bryce that other people seem to know. The whole bloodhound thing. Even Ethan and Connor knew that. Jessica also seems to have information on Danica, and at this point, and this line broke my heart, Bryce and Rune were talking in their heads. She asked Rune if, she, if he wanted an honest answer about how she was feeling, and she says, I don't know how much more of this surprise Danica had a big secret stuff I can take. It feels like I don't even know. It feels like I really never really knew her. And it just breaks my heart that time and time again, it's that's just been the happenings of this book. Like at this point, I wouldn't even be surprised if Danica had a whole ass mate that she never told Bryce about. Like honestly, I don't even know what else Danica was hiding from Bryce, but it's pretty freaking crazy. One thing that I have yet to mention that I am absolutely loving in this book is the romance between Fury and June. I love their dynamic together. I love how in love they are. And and most of all, I just love how protective over June Fury is. And when they're in the meat market, Fury says, I promise I'll burn this place to the ground for her one day because apparently June's brother was in the meat market running some underground fights or he was in some underground fights. And so that's how unfortunately he was killed. And just seeing that protectiveness, it's just everything. This has always been my thing. Miss Janet is very well known for choosing a mate or a partner to start out the season series with, and then as the series go on, we switch love interests. In Throne of Glass, it happened three times. Akatar, it happened twice. And so I am really wondering if Bryce and Hunt are actually endgame. And I know a lot of people don't want the switcheroo to happen. However, I don't know if I buy the whole I choose you, you're my mate thing. I really hope that it comes full circle and it comes to better fruition. The lighting just went down a lot. I hope it comes to better fruition later on. I just don't know if I'm seeing the deep connection that mates typically have in an SJM book. I feel like I'm in this book and that's something that I will say. I feel like I'm missing that synchronicity and that chemistry that they had in book one. I don't know. There's there's a certain lack of magic in their relationship right now. Like, yes, the sexual tension's fantastic, but the smutty scenes when they're kissing, when they're saying I love you, I don't know why I have such a deep disconnect to those scenes, which I typically don't have in SJM book. And I don't know if it's just like my intuition at an all-time level being like, they're not maids, don't even get attached. Or if it's just like out of writing. I really don't know. There have been these lines that have been like really cheesy about like, who knows, maybe I was waiting for you all along. And then this, which is sus as hell, like I don't buy it. I don't know why I don't buy it. Where Bryce tells Hunt, I don't know, but if you're not my mate, Athelar, no one is. I wouldn't even be surprised if somebody came into the picture and was like, and she was just like, you're my mate. Like it's not Hunt. I wouldn't be surprised. <gasps> No, no. I just had this idea in my head, but I don't want it. It's not happening. She is not mating with anybody from the Aquatar world. A thought just crossed my mind and we're not going there. Absolutely not. It's like, I'll have to see it to believe it. And up until I do, I'm going to be skeptical of it all. See, they have a keen awareness of each other. And I wonder almost if that keen awareness that they feel is not the mating bond, but it's instead their powers because they're so complementary of each other. And that's what's connecting them, but not a mating bond. I may be so far off, but I don't know if they're mates. I don't think they are. father? The Heinz second is Danica's father. A whole ass evil man. <laughs> I'm so shook right now. Let me go back. Let me leave. <laughs> Sarah Janet, what the fuck?
Hello, everybody. So I fell massively asleep on the couch. Hello. I literally sat down to read, read some, fell asleep for two hours. I just woke up. I had to take my makeup off because I was just like, it's not happening anymore. And I've just put my overnight moisturizing mask and my lip balm. And so I'm ready to sit down and read. I definitely feel refreshed and renewed now to actually sit down and read for a bit. I have a few updates for you that I didn't mention on my previous of data. Let's go over these right now. Okay, so setting you guys down on the couch because it's a lot comfier than actually holding you. They just fought the Under King. I'm in the scene directly after. There's been a hint already, just as a small side note, that Celestina might not be into men. So she's definitely not into Efraim by any means, and she might just not be into men altogether. So I'm excited to see where that goes. But Bryce and Hunt fought the Under King, and their powers worked so incredible together. I was in awe of how well they bounced of each other. The way that Hunt also found out that he also possesses the ability to manage, not manage, but control energy and electricity as a Thunderbird can. Just because, and this is what I was talking about earlier, lightning and energy is not that far off. It's kind of the same. And so the fact that Polian, who is the Prince of the Pit, was right. I'm excited to see where it goes, but we've seen all of these hints towards Bryce and Hunt's power working really well together in battle because I, I don't know if it's like divine guidance, divine intervention, if it's just them being God blessed. I don't know what exactly it is about their powers that just work so well. And I almost wonder if Thea had a companion in the first war that also had this power that we don't know of yet could potentially be the reason as to why these two work so well together. But that shit was so badass when she was running and he just hit her and she exploded with light and then the sword was like lit with the lightning power. I, that was a lot. That was a lot, lot, but it was so, so good. I keep wondering if that's the reason why they have such a keen awareness for each other, because the fact that they get along so well and that they fight so well doesn't necessarily equate to them being mates. There seems to be something off in this book about their chemistry. And yes, well, they're in a weird spot where they don't really know where their relationship stands. And because of the pact that they made until winter solstice, and then now Bryce being betrothed to Cormac, but obviously not wanting to be with him. And it's so convoluted. I don't know if they're actually mates or if this is just, it's giving Tamlin vibes. It's giving me Tamlin vibes, not necessarily in the way that Tamlin was behaving in Akumov, but yes, in the lack of chemistry, I'm just not feeling the same vibe as I did in Crescent City, which is so interesting because I don't know if it's purposeful or if the chemistry and the romance is just getting lost in the midst of everything else that's happening because the plot in this book is really freaking big. What struck me as interesting too, however, in that particular regard is the fact that Rune said that Bryce smells different. We already saw this when they <laughs> ate each other out, hello. People around them said like, you smell like each other, but now we're getting a reference to you smell different. Wonder if it's because they verbally accepted each other as mates, that's something internally is happening up until they actually have sex and complete the mating bond. I don't know because it's never really clear as to how the mating bond works for the Fae. And so it's very confusing and I wish I kind of had an answer, but I also wonder if that's SJM's way of not telling us up until we see Bryce's true mate. I genuinely don't know what's happening with this whole romance thing, but I'm just gonna take it at face value and just keep on going. We just found out in that fight with the Under King that there is no eternal resting place. And it broke my heart for Hunt to be asking or kind of having this internal monologue about, then where's my mom? And it just broke my heart for him to even be thinking that and to also just know that whatever Bryce thought she was giving passage to Danica in the first book, whatever she traded is not really reality. Like it's all a lie and it's all part of what the Asteri have said. And so how many more things are gonna pan out to be a lie? Also, I'm not so convinced. See, now mm, there's a, this certain chemistry between Rune and Agent Daybright that if Celestina is into women, is she Daybright? Which was my initial theory. I don't think so, but who could be Daybright? Sophie? I feel like that makes no sense though. Why would she turn into flame? Flame, House of Flame and Shadow. Hypaxia? We do know that she's a necromancer. What is the hind again? I know the hind is a shapeshifter. So where do shapeshifters belong? Because it 
make sense that Rune presents itself as stars. Could the Hind be Agent Day Bright? But that would make no sense. The Hind's bad. She evil. We'll get there when we get there. But I feel like it also could make sense. I'm thinking and I'm gonna go. What is Baxian? Why is Baxian there? Not Bryce calling herself Royal Highness Princess Bryce Dannon just so she could get Juniper that titular role. And also there's a little otter called Fitzroy. Stop. Stop right now. It had a little name tag and everything that was too cute. They're currently with the Mystics. Apparently, they've encountered another Prince of Hell, Thanatos. Prince of what exactly? The Prince of the Ravin. Ravin? Ravine? Jesus, my English is failing me today. He's present and voting, and he said, you're the one my brother speaks about. I love whenever Adas is mentioned. I'm very scared. Danica was looking for information about lineage of the shifters in the Great Library of Parthos. Gotta stand Declan literally being one of those CSI investigators. He's like, I've clarified to the view, <laughs> but it's so very clearly bullshit. Like when they're trying to pan into the license plate of a car. Oh, I knew the Thay archives were gonna come in handy. Let's go, Bryce. Wait a minute. So who is Jessica's enemy, if not Sabine, and if not Danica. Other Fendiers, but the records have been lost to time? Okay, but this is breaking my heart. <sighs> the Prime just said Danica trusted no one except you, but did she? Like, we know that she did, but it still hit so hard knowing how much shit she hid from Bryce. I don't know why that got me, but I just, I'm crying. <laughs> I don't know why that got me. It's such a tiny line. I think one of the lost Fenders is one of the mystics, if not all of them. Danica has been after, well, she read this book that traced back all of the Fenders back to the beginning of time. However, we only have public record of the Fenders over the course of 5,000 years. Anything before that has been lost or evaporated. These mystics don't know who they are, where they come from. They just know that they're wolves. And Ethan, just said that she was an alpha. I wouldn't be surprised if she is a lost Fendir. And also, there's been a lot of talk about Ethan potentially being an alpha of his own pack, which I would totally love to see because he is a phenomenal, I was gonna say human being, but he's not exactly human. Phone sex, not cute. Maybe it's just me projecting, but phone sex is hella cringe to me and I do not need it in a fantasy book. Like I'm good. The human rebellion is ready to strike. There is this talk of a suit, which I haven't mentioned, but the Asteri are building these mech suits that apparently are going to be very powerful and the Human Rebellion is trying to get rid of those. They're ready to strike and I'm not ready for any battle to ensue. The other thing that made me really emo, which I completely understand why too, when Bryce called the ballet to secure Juniper's titular role on whatever show they were putting up and now Juniper's mad. I understand both sides of it, right? Because both feelings are valid. Bryce just wanted to be helpful with her friend and kind of provide something that she knows her friend has been dreaming of for ages now. However, Juniper has always had a lot of pride into making her career herself and being able to build that with absolutely nobody's help. Just broke my heart because after being able to mend all of her friendships, Bryce just keeps kind of putting herself in these situations where people will obviously have a bit of backlash. Good morning, friends. Today is finishing Sky and Bread time. So I'm finishing this today. I have 293 pages left, I think. Some things that happened yesterday that I didn't even mention. Pippa shooting them down was 
unexpected but I also should have expected it at the same time as part of the human rebellion it always kind of turned around in my head of like how accepting are they really gonna be of the veneer and when are they gonna turn against them even though they're kind of working with the veneer I'm gonna say veneer because vanner sounds like banner but also the follow-up to that which was hunt snapping I see this is what I was telling my brother yesterday I do not really care for the smut in this book as opposed to other SJM books that I've just been like a level smut and it's just been fantastic there's some disconnect and I don't know why it's happening but it's happening and I hope that the next book it's better in terms of like the hunt price chemistry the biggest best moment so far has been Hunt snapping and Bryce trying to calm him down, which even then does not feel as great as some of her other books, but that has probably been one of my favorite moments of theirs in this book. I just kind of like when they snap and it's like, calm down, don't listen to anything else. I'm here, I'm safe. I kind of like that, I'm not gonna lie. I'm a sucker for the mating bond. And so I love that. I love seeing their powers once more work in tandem. It's fantastic. Rune kind of clarified it of like you guys have the fae mating bond i just don't know how because like he's angel and you're fae but you do and it's rare and take advantage of it and go fuck your dude i still have many questions i feel like this book is leaving me with more questions hello chloe with more questions than it's giving me answers also gorshian bullets i will assume that's how they're pronounced mean no good in this new equipment they mean no good i am terrified of what it means moving forward sarah j maas is very notorious for separating mates in a very big way we saw it in akatar we saw it in Throne of Glass and at this point, this being the third book, I still don't know if this is going to be a trilogy or a quartet. I do not want her to do that. She has spent all of this book separating Bryce and Hunt on God. If she separates them again by the end, I will literally go ballistic. Now, I guess it's all a matter of finding a meal, seeing if he wants to be a part of this, though some people do seem to know where Emil is. So that's interesting. <laughs> I said I didn't see a body. Now I'm seeing one. She's dead, people. <laughs> Bryce sent Emil to the Viper Queen? Look, y'all, I don't even know what's happening anymore with this book. All I know is I need to set up for sprints, but that's the very last thing I read. When did this happen? I have so many questions. I need to keep reading, but I have sprints. I'm mad. Y'all, this is so sad. Bryce had this all planned so that they could find Emil, and she figured out that the meeting spot was not the Bone Quarter, but instead it was the meat market, and that Danica had somehow implied that the Viper Queen would help, and she did. She was hiding a meal. They just went to look for him. Fury is taking him, and I knew it in my soul. I was like, she's gonna take him to Bryce's parents, and she said, all the documents will be waiting for you. Birth certificate, adoption papers. You're part of the Quinlan Tilago clan now. We're a crazy bunch, but we love each other. Tell Randall to make you chocolate croissants on Sunday. I don't know why that got me, but I'm crying. And the kid doesn't have any power but then who i'm pretty sure the kid went all like this at the beginning of the book and he sucked in all the power and there's so many questions but i'm so emotional right now also also i freaking love that they rescued the fire sprites and the dragon and they're living with I like that they have new housemates, the three fire sprites and then the dragon. And I love how Rune said, please tell me they're at least here legally. <laughs> nope, Flynn said cheerfully. <laughs> I freaking love them so much. Oh my god. Any mention of Lehaba just breaks my heart. Page 553. Uh, Bryce is talking to the fire sprites and she said, she died three months ago. She gave her life to save mine. And then she replied, the draw line has long been scattered to the winds. We don't know how many remain to even lose one. She bowed her head. Lehaba. I can't. <laughs> they just told her in honor of her. <laughs> we shall call you the ally of our people. And I, this is so sad. Maybe we'll get a juicy Flynn and dragon romance. I see the banter. I see it. It's kind of cute.
Celestina and High Bakes. Yeah. What? Oh my god. What is happening? Bryce's name has officially been changed by her father without her consent, which we absolutely hate. Hello. But I love how she used that to her advantage. And she's like, Hunt is actually Prince because we're mates and you can't do anything about it. And it's definitely going to get some repercussions. I can just feel it. Good for her. Good for Bryce to just come in in her own little signature sassy way and do whatever she wants. I still don't buy this whole mate thing. I'm sorry. There's just something off with this book and I might be the only one. But then there's moments like these, which make me go, aw, everything that ever happened to me, it was all so I could meet you, Quinlan, be there with you, I'm yours forever. Everything I am is yours, she said against his lips. <sighs> am I the only one who's not convinced about this? We'll see what happens. I, I think something's gonna happen. I pigs your promise that if Ethan took care of her, she would figure out what's happening with Connor and we're there and I'm scared and I'm terrified. Okay, here we go. Rune! I am much more here for this romance between Rune and Daybright! Okay! That was hot! Oh my god, Rune! Hey, he squeezed that booty like there was no tomorrow! Oh my god! See, this is cringe. I'm issuing a royal decree for you to fuck me, Hunt. That's cringe. I knew it! I knew it! Adas will stay as his lover? Is that why he is so... Oh... Oh... What truth? What is happening? What is happening? When she learns what truth? Can people stop saying it? The Autumn King said it. Everybody's been saying it. What truth? What truth does she need to know? What's happening? Can they please summon Adas? Like... Why is nobody summoning Adas? I need some answers! When are they gonna find out what's happening? I know what she's gonna do. I know what she's gonna do. No, Miss Mass, Miss Mass. I know what the fuck she's gonna do. And she's about to do the same thing that she did in Empire of Storm. And on God, if she does that, I am going to be so mad. She's about to teleport everybody away. I'm on the last hundred pages of this book. And Hunt said, I picks you first, then ruin. I'm, no, I'm gonna be very angry at Sarah Janet. Oh shit, they have Pollux with them. Y'all, when I said it, I was kidding. When I said that, oh my God, I was kidding. It was not supposed to be true. Daxin was Danica's mate. Oh my God. <sighs> Danica. <gasps> I was right. The mystic is a Fendir. Oh my God. Parion, don't be stupid. He wants to sell himself to the Viper Queen. I love this. I love the angst between Rune and Daxin. Okay, your fate is bound to mine. My mind found yours in the darkness across the ocean. No fancy crystal required you think that's nothing. I'm going to find you. I'll find you one day, I promise. You remind me that I'm alive too. Are they mates? What is happening? This book is a mate fest. What is happening? They're gonna have thy money sex. Rune. The Asteri don't have any power. They need first light to survive. They're literally leeching off of everybody in Crescent Z. Oh my god, no, no, Mordok, get the hell out of here. Oh my god, you guys. <laughs> Wait, what's happening? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? <gasps> They've conquered other planets? You guys, what the fuck is happening? The Asteri lured all of them into Midgard? Rowan, don't be dumb! This is literally the same thing that 
happened in Empire of Swords? I'm not okay. No, Rue, don't make the same mistake that Alien's cousin did. What is happening? What is happening? You guys! No! No! Wait! No! Wait! Wait! Eyes like furies? Amrin? Is it Amrin? I read this in mouth. Somebody understood. Wait, wait, wait. I can't. You guys, I'm not even kidding. I can't breathe. You see this? <laughs> this is Mel TV at her prime. You guys, hello. It has been two days since I finished Sky and Breath, and I had just had to get my thoughts together on this one. I was obviously massively impacted by the ending, and then by the time that I was done, I didn't know what to do with myself. And so we're here. I am here with the final update, with my final rating, and with my final thoughts on this subject matter before I close this out and put it out tomorrow for you guys. What a turn of events. I did not expect to be as right on as many accounts, I guess, as I was. You guys know me, I be throwing crazy ass theories out there and hoping for the best. And sometimes I'm Sherlock Holmes, sometimes I'm Sherlock, how about no? It'd be swinging sometimes. Sometimes things happen and sometimes they don't. I loved this book and I think it was the necessary bridge between this one and the next one. I think particularly when we talk about the Asteri, they are so powerful and what they've established in this world has been spreading out throughout millennia. And so how do you essentially dethrone the people who are ruling this land? and build a hierarchy from scratch because what you're doing is destabilizing a nation essentially and so it's so grand that I am not surprised that we had to cross over worlds. It's also very interesting to me after reading everything about the Asteri archives and everything that Bryce found in the building that the Asteri reside that they've been conquering other worlds. That part I did not expect though it makes a lot of sense and in classic Mel fashion I was reeling afterwards and I just needed to see what people were saying about the book and so I went on Reddit and I did not remember this at all. This is about potentially the Asteri and Aquatar. The Fae were not the first masters of this world. According to our oldest legends, most now forgotten, we were created by beings who were near gods and monsters. The Daglan, they ruled for millennia and enslaved us and the humans. They were petty and cruel and drank the magic of the land like wine, which is exactly what the Asteri are doing in Crescent City. So with the whole truth teller thing, I felt like I was massively stretching it. It ended up being a thing, y'all. And I am just, I'm so excited for the next book. And I also wasn't sure how many books were supposed to be in the Crescent City series. And according to Sarah, there's supposed to be three books. She is signed on for three books. But she did say, I believe, around the time that book one was released, that if she felt she needed more books, she would release more books. I cannot imagine a world where Crescent City can only be three books. Yes, they both have been 800 pages. The topic is so grand and what needs to be explored 
so big that if this is not also embedded into the story of Akotar, which is just too messy, there needs to be at least one more book for this to feel believable. I wouldn't really even be mad if this ended up being like a five, six book series, especially now with the arrival of Bryce into Valaris. She is going to train there. Her powers are not ready. And we saw that at the beginning of the book. We saw that in the teasers that SJM put out. We saw it everywhere in the book, really, that she does not understand what powers she possesses. She does not understand winnowing, which is essentially teleporting. She could even have Dimati abilities. Who knows what Bryce is capable of that the Asteri do not even really acknowledge in fear of her discovering how powerful she truly is. And so I have no doubt in my mind that between Resand and Amran, probably more so Amran because she has more knowledge of the ancients, she is going to train Bryce or at least help her. And when I tell you guys something that I really want to see in the next book is Bryce and Cassian on a ring getting it on between that Salago training and oh, it's just gonna be so good if they do have like a showdown in the training ring. And I also have the question, Asriel holds Truth Teller so close to him, is he just gonna hand it over to Bryce and be like, hi, there you go. It's just what's gonna happen now with Truth Teller. And also in this book, we get the mention of Faye who can shapeshift into animals or other beings other than Faye. And I'm wholeheartedly convinced that that is from Throne of Glass. We've seen Faye shapeshifters in Throne of Glass a lot. The Cadre, Aelin, Maeve, Maeve, I still don't know how to pronounce her name, but we've seen plenty of those in that series. And so I'm also now just trying to figure out how and when this is going to connect Throne of Glass into all of this, or if the Throne of Glass world is going to be left alone, because given the ending of Throne of Glass, if anybody disturbs their peace, like, shit dog, that's messed up. I just know, after this, I'm gonna reread every single Sarah J Maas book, and I'm going to have a whole document trying to connect shit, because that's just what I do. Things that I also wasn't expecting for Celestina to not be as good as she seemed, she was actually reporting back to the Asteri, which is fucking messed up. And also for Cormac to die, I love it though, just because I don't foresee him being a constant character in the series, especially given that Sophie has died. So I feel like his reason for being in the book is dead. It did say that his union with a Starborn Fae was going to be the salvation, essentially. And him helping out clearly brought Bryce to Valaris. So I feel like that prophecy has already been kind of fulfilled. However, I do need to go into what makes this book not a five star in my eyes. Initially, when I was reading the book, I was like, okay, this is a three star. Like, it's fine. It's not stellar mass like we've seen other books be. I think it was the last hundred pages that really solidified the fact that it was a four star for me. So that is my rating. I'm giving it four stars. Miss Mass in this one really said reuse, recycle. And there are a lot of plot points and a lot of plot twists, a lot of happenings in the story that have already happened in Throne of Glass and in Aquatar. So they lose their shock value when they happen here. Yes, obviously they made me sad. And yes, obviously I was still kind of shocked, but I feel like it loses its weight once you've used it once or twice or just once, but it had the impact that it had in another series. I understand that for people who have never read the other two series, like it's a really fucking big moment. But for people who are mass trash like myself and we've already read everything i read it and i was like dude this is literally throne of glass all over again and while i'm freaking out think of something else as a plot point also this book could have needed some serious editing this book could have been at least 300 pages forgive me if i interrupt this broadcast however i meant to say that this book could have easily been 300 pages shorter than it actually is so it could have been 500 pages just back to the video just to clarify and i wholeheartedly believe it would not have changed the narrative there were a lot of passive unnecessary moments in this book. There were also so many moments that were stretched out for longer than they needed to be. Therion's POV I did not care for. I think his whole reason to be there was Emil and Sophie, which Sophie ended up being dead and then Emil ended up not having any power and we spent virtually five to six hundred pages going around circles with this particular subject matter only for us to stumble into a wall and be like haha got you bitch it's actually useless which i understand the pivotal role that sophie played into the story and actually letting them know in some way shape or form that they needed to go to the asteri archive but beyond that it just felt like a very useless narrative to use if it was not going anywhere beyond having the coordinates that they found when they found her body like just find her body earlier it absolutely makes no difference and emil too i was 
was convinced that when Pipa saw him on the ship manipulating energy, so then when he didn't have any power, I was like, well, I guess I should have known. But at the same time, Emil was just there for Bryce to be like, hi, mother and father, I gift thee a child. Why did we go around in so many circles to only for Bryce to be scheming behind the scenes and spending so much long looking for this kid? Like, it's so unnecessary, especially if Bryce was involved from day one into finding him. And my other thing that I'm still not convinced, and I know I said it a lot in the video, so I'll try not to be too repetitive and bring up new points as to why I believe this. And Bryce and Hunt in Crescent City 1, I liked. I've read Crescent City, the first book, three times now, and I think with each and every reread, I have warmed up to Hunt. I did not initially love him, especially given the twist in book one and him being involved with the synth and wanting to overthrow the government, and now we know how necessary that is. However, the fact that Hunt had so many secrets just rubbed me the wrong way, and it's now walking into this book, I was actually into them. I genuinely, everybody had convinced me, Mel, their endgame, Mel, there's no other way. Even Sarah in interview said that their endgame, but I just don't buy it. My main theory has always been that Adas is Bryce's mate, and now knowing that he was in love with Thea, I obviously don't know how to feel about this theory anymore because apparently these two are mated and then he was in love with Thea. The chemistry was completely off in this book, and whether this was intentional or whether it was just lost in everything else happening in the story, I did not vibe with Hunt and Bryce in this book. We start out the narrative and they're incredibly communicative with each other. They seem to be in acute synchronicity and they're displaying the growth that they went through in Crescent City 1 emotionally, both separate and together. And I like the fact that they made the pact. It was shocking, but I liked it because that meant that they could get to know each other. Their relationship in Crescent City 1 gave me very much Rowaylin vibes. However, we reach a point in the narrative where their chemistry literally goes downhill miscommunication starts happening, secrets start being hidden from the both of them, and Hunt says it. Hunt's like, we're a team, like, why aren't you telling me anything? And that was very frustrating. I also feel like Bryce's character kind of receded in this one, where we saw a lot of growth in Crescent City 1 into her embracing who and what she needed to be at the end. We see a Bryce in this book that is not only very reluctant, and honestly, understandably so, because it's a big burden to carry, but very reluctant to form a part into any of this, not only because she's been threatened by the Asteri, but also also because she's like, I just want to lead a normal life, but also a Bryce who is incredibly petty, sassy in a very just not good way, and somebody who was downright rude a lot of the time to Hunt and very demeaning as well. So Bryce in this book, in my opinion, lacked a lot of the stuff that I loved about her in book one. Her banter in this book was absolutely horrible and cringy. All of the smut between these two was absolutely horrid, and usually smut by SJM is fantastic, but I was reading this book, and when she said the words, fuck me like the prince you are. I was just sitting there wondering what I'd done to deserve this crap <laughs> because it was just so bad. The phone sex was also terrible and everything else, I honestly did not feel chemistry between the two of them. If they had truly been mates, I wouldn't have felt that way. There are a lot of signs of them having some semblance of a connection, but now I'm just wondering if it's their powers being more connected than they expect them to be and that is fooling them into believing that they have a mating bond. But then also, the way that I can debunk that is that Hunt literally snapped when they tried to kill Bryce, but he's very overprotective over her. However, I don't seem to see the reciprocity from Bryce's side, and I'm just looking at that, and it seems to be like a very one-sided sort of relationship. Even when they're saying the declarations of love, Hunt is a lot more romantic than Bryce is, and when I look at that, it just doesn't add up, especially with what we saw in book one, it just doesn't add up in my eyes, and there's such a lack of understanding in this book and in the series in general as to what mates are and how they work and it's because mates aren't really as big of a thing in Crescent City as they are in Aurelia and in Prithian. I'm curious to know now that she's in Valaris and observing all of these mated couples how she's going to react and how she is going to potentially reassess what she has with Hunt and maybe potentially realize as well that he is not her mate and if a mate does come along down the line if it's Ada's or somebody else wonder what decision she will make if she will choose that other person over Hunt or vice versa, or if there will be some semblance of polyamory in the series, because I definitely could see that as well. I also think there's a possibility of Hunt dying in the next 
book or few books. I think if there is any switcheroo to be made, which we know Miss Janet is infamous for, I don't want him to be villainized. I don't want him to go through what Tamlin went through because I care too much about Hunt as an individual. I hope that if there is a switcheroo, that there is a really good explanation as to what's gonna happen. And I genuinely think that if there is a switch, Hunt is going to die. And that will essentially be the only way for Bryce to get with anybody else. And if they are endgame, and this is all just ridiculous, ridiculousness on my end. I don't know what happened in this book because their relationship does not even touch the toes of the relationship that I read in Crescent City. It's wild that these two would have more chemistry when they're not together than when they're together and quote unquote mated. The fact that Rune had to tell them that they're mated also doesn't sit right with me because when you know, you just kind of know. And Bryce was just like, oh really, we are? We, we're mates? Oh, I can vibe with that, I guess. I'm just very confused as to why we've seen this execution in this book with this couple. Is it weird to anybody else? Let me know, please. If I'm crazy, don't say that I'm crazy, but just let me know your thoughts because I need to know if I'm not alone on this. Also, we found out that Ada's wasn't even on this book, <laughs> which just confused me because it was Rigilus disguised as Ada's who broke down the wards, but we saw Polian say that Ada's was readying the armies for Bryce anyway. Is Rigilus somehow infiltrated in hell to know that? Or was it actually? I'm just so confused with that part and I think that's what this book did a lot. It gave me more questions than it provided answers and then it just confused me a lot. And in terms of execution, I don't love that, which is why, again, I was leaning more for a three star than a four star. Could very well be that I was delusional and sleep deprived because I read this book in a little over 24 hours. I will definitely need to reread this book before Crescent City 3 to see what the heck is going to happen because there's too much information. And I think that is it for today. I think that is everything that I needed to get off my chest and relay over to you guys. I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a massive thumbs up down below. It's gonna be a long ass video and there is nothing spoiler free about this book, honestly. Comment down below if you've read this book, if you're looking forward to read this book. I mean, I hope that you've read it if you're here. Let me know all of your thoughts down below. That's what I'm most curious of. Are there any things you cut onto that I didn't necessarily mention in this video? Any Easter eggs, any information, any theories, what you personally thought about any of the things that I've mentioned? I'd love to have a deep discussion with you guys down in the comments because I need to go deep into all of the reading vlogs of everybody, into all of the Reddit threads, and just watching all of the host of content because I need to know what people think. So let me know all of your thoughts down below. Let's leave some lightning and crescent moon emojis down below if you've made it to the very end. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already. I have constantly have learning videos that I'm sure you do not want to miss. And if you want more content from me, if you want live shows, a reading sprint, a book club, buddy reads, extra videos, extra content, and stuff that you're not going to see anywhere else, you should sign up to Patreon. We call ourselves The Citadel and the link for that is always down below alongside all of my social medias. I love you guys so, so much and I shall see you on the next one. Bye guys.